where the central banks come together and try to address uh, problems that are similar to others. Uh, one, one chapter that is outside the, 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 the hub, the innovation hub, is the Cyber Resilience Center, which its name tells itself, is just to, to join forces to, 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 to assure a resiliency of financial systems in, in the face of uh, types of attacks related, uh, attack, uh, different types of attacks that we all know about them. Now, the HOP is probably, it's a unique uh, initiative. It's a very decisive, very decisive initiative uh, for, for, for uh, different central banks to join forces in, in, in joint ventures with the VIS to establish uh, innovation centers around the world. Uh, obviously, this is to benefit all the central banking community. It has three objectives. It's one to scope, and that's the reason why we have it, it diversified geographically. Technology developments around the world try to digest what those technologies are and in what way can they affect central banking and financial markets. Second, to develop prototypes, ideas, research that more than anything can produce public goods for the central banking community. I mean, here the, the point is we don't want each central bank to, to invent the hot water. You know, uh, the idea here is, uh, is to join forces and for all the community to benefit uh, from those developments. And also we want to develop a network of experts. Uh, central bankers do not have necessarily all the experts. We don't have probably all the capacity, uh, you know, to, to bring together experts like uh, big techs and so on and so forth. But if we join forces, we will be able to fare, fare much better. So I think that uh, we are doing this quite successfully. Again, we will be, we will be having uh, eight centers uh, uh, by the end of this year. And that will put uh, the VIS, uh, I would say, uh, leading this effort towards uh, developing technology for central bankers. Now, CBDC, my, 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 my own, I, I think probably where I have been more critical, if, if the term critical applies, is I try to, to, to reinforce the idea that today's fiat money works because there is a strong institution like a central bank that provides trust to money and that's what make 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 makes money work in the world and many many private develop developments uh, trying to substitute other types of currencies and not use a central bank currency uh, ignore many of the elements many of the 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 the, the fundamental aspects that central bank bring to payments and to financial systems, among them the finality of payments. So the only one who can bring that to the table in a forceful way is the central bank, is our central banks. And given that 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 we have the technological capacity to do it, I think I think that the best possible solution yeah. is for central banks to put on the table central bank digital currencies. That doesn't mean that there is no space for collaboration with the private sector. As a matter of fact, it, for me, a preferable scheme is a tier system where the central banks provide a, 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 the basic currency, but then the private sector can build on, 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 on that. I'll stop here. Right, just quickly before I turn to Jens Wiedemann, I'd like to ask you though, I mean, we already have one CBDC so far in the world, which emerged from the Bahamas. Um, You've done a fascinating survey just recently of central banks, which showed that most are working on it. But you say that about a fifth of the world's population will be in a country with a CBDC in three years time, according to this survey. Do you think we're going to see CBDCs emerging as a serious force in the next two or three years? You personally, when you look at the discussions going around the BIS Innovation Hub? Most central banks are approaching this not as a race. I think here what, uh, the, I mean, this is a, a huge step forward. CBDC is something that uh, has tremendous complexity. And there is one particular issue. It cannot fail. It cannot fail at any particular point in time. And to assure the type of resiliency, it takes a lot. 
Uh, it has many implications for the uh, for the architecture of the financial system, for monetary policy, for for monetary policy implementation. So it's the type of thing where there doesn't seem to be a real urgency for a CBDC to put to put, put be put on the table tomorrow. What is necessary is just to have a medium-term horizon, but make sure that it's top quality and that there is no room for mistake. Uh, so as, 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 as it has been said before, this is the type of problem where uh, it's better to go slow because we are in a hurry. Right. Well, uh, well Ruben, I'd like to ask you from the European perspective how you see this, because you've given a series of speeches recently on this point, um, warning about the danger of crowding out the private sector if the central banks um, come in and try and dominate it. You've suggested that actually any CBDC would have to coexist next to cash. And you've also pointed out some of the fascinating implications for the banking sector um, if the CBDCs come in and essentially disintermediate the private sector banks. So I'm curious, do you expect to see the Eurozone adopting a CBDC within the next two or three years? And how do you square the difficult, difficult circle of issues that you've raised in your speeches recently? I guess the short answer I mean, is the, short the time horizon that you uh, highlighted is certainly too short, uh, but my forecast would be that we are all seriously working on CBDC and a lot of central banks will, of course, uh, introduce also CBDC over the, over, time, over the time to come. But let me just give you a, a bit of a longer uh, response to your question, because I think this whole debate about uh, crypto assets, stable coins or digital money more broadly illustrates uh, one thing first and foremost, which is that the need of consumers, but also the preference of consumers might change. They are looking for convenient, fast, internet ready, seamless uh, payments. And in that sense, I think like Augustine uh, said, my first approach would be that it is our responsibility to provide the backbone of those payment systems and to keep them uh, state of the art. And then for commercial banks, to offer the services based on this uh, backbone and also to provide the interface with, with customers. But that's also, I mean, that's, I think, the, the general uh, operation of, of the system, and that uh, is what we should not question fundamentally. But there are, of course, other developments that bring CBDC into, uh, into, into play. One is that uh, cash, the, the use of cash, which is a claim on the central bank, so the only claim that the general public can hold, is declining. So I think it is worthwhile reflecting of what that means and whether we should substitute that paper claim with a uh, digital claim. Uh, and also CBDC might uh, raise market efficiency, allowing, for instance, uh, to uh, execute automated payments and uh, to use uh, the central bank currency in smart contracts, for instance. And there's also, of course, the aspect of financial sovereignty. So uh, as Augustine, I think, indicated, I think it's worthwhile disentangling the debate into two components. One is the currency part, where I think we should be quite self-confident what we have to offer is a stable currency. Uh, and a lot of the more successful modern means of payments are linked to our uh, legal tender. And then there is the technological part, which uh, is interesting, and we should focus on, on, on that part. Um, but at the same time, we central banks face a very difficult uh, trade-off when it comes to uh, CBDC. Of course, money relies on network effects. So the more widely it is used, the better it is for everybody. So uh, basically, uh, this means that we should increase the attractiveness of CBDC. On the other hand, and you mentioned that already, CBDC could come with some potential side effects and risks. And to mitigate those, we would need to reduce the attractiveness of uh, CBDC. And one of those risks that you uh, mentioned and that I highlighted in my speeches is the risk of disintermediation. I mean, CBDC would become a very close uh, substitute for uh, bank deposits. And in times of stress, the attractiveness of CBDC versus a bank deposit would even increase, which could mean that the uh, danger of a bank run increases 
Uh, and it also means that uh, we have a sort of uh, uh, stronger reliance on refinancing uh, through the central bank. So it means that the footprint of the central bank increases, our balance sheet uh, increases in size, but also with the risk in our balance sheet might become, might become larger. And this then leads us to this very difficult trade-off and to the discussion about uh, restrictions on the amount you can hold in CBDC, but also on two-tier remuneration uh, system. So the bottom line of what I wanted to say um, is that we should not try to crowd out the private sector, but we should rather also enable the private sector to offer the services that the consumer needs in this environment, which is uh, heavily reliant on online commerce, for instance, which must, which, which must be quicker than, than before, et cetera. And that's why we, uh, as Augustine also uh, alluded to, we uh, invented, we have introduced in our target system, for instance, the possibility to execute instant payments. Uh, and, and there you're very close to the finality of uh, payments that Augustine mentioned, but with commercial bank money. So I think there are other ways to satisfy the need of the consumer uh, or firms uh, than uh, central bank digital currencies. So there's, there's no rush or no urgency to introduce CBDC. I think it's rather something we should reflect on quite carefully. And that's what we all do. Just one quick question before I turn to Jay, which is very Europe, European specific, which is some people say that Europe needs a CBDC to actually accelerate meaningful integration across the Eurozone of the payment system. And that would be really the biggest single reason to have it in Europe. What are your views on that? Are there other ways to get that meaningful integration or do you actually need a CBDC to actually do that? No, I think you're, you're right in the sense that uh, market fragmentation is an issue uh, in Europe. And that's why a lot of the private uh, um, payment initiatives face certain hurdles that are difficult to, to, to overcome. But we have seen in the recent past, for instance, the European Payment Issue Initiative, which is a group of uh, European uh, banks and, and, and payment providers who joined forces to exactly provide that European, pan-European uh, wide approach to overcome this market fragmentation. So CBDC, again, is not the only uh, answer. Uh, there are also private initiatives. And I would even argue that if fragmentation is an, is an issue, my first thought would go uh, towards uh, regulation and what can we do to overcome this fragmentation through regulation. Right, right. Well, thank you. Well, I'd like to turn to Chairman Powell at this point and ask how, what you're doing in this respect, because you're currently in a very interesting position, Powell, uh, Chairman Powell. You know, on the one hand, you have some politicians in the US warning that if the US does not accelerate its activities in this area, you're going to see China and others create digital currencies, which could threaten the dollar. You're seeing people like Gary Cohn, um, formerly of the White House, warning that um, the US is lagging behind in financial innovation. And yet at the same time, you have a lot of the establishment looking with great nervousness about what's happening in Silicon Valley and saying we cannot let things like Bitcoin go completely spiral out of control. So how is the Fed trying to square the circle? And what exactly are you doing in Boston with MIT right now in relation to the CPTC discussions and um, developments? Thank you, Jillian. Well, there's, there's a lot in that question. <laughs> there are several questions in that question. So let me try to go through this. First, I wanna say, um, applaud really Augustine for um, making technology and innovation a central focus of his leadership of the BIS, including the Innovation Hub and the other things that he mentioned. I think that was a very wise and insightful direction and, and I think it's already uh, uh, providing significant benefits. I would also say, as far as CBDCs are concerned, two things follow for me from the dollar status as the print world's principal reserve currency. The first is that we, we need, we have an obligation to be on the cutting edge of understanding the technological challenges as well as the potential costs and benefits of issuing a CBDC. And we are, as, as I'm happy to share with you, exploring all of this. We're not in a mode of trying to make a decision at this point. We are experimenting with technology, discussing policy, and all the things that, that have been discussed by both Augustine and Jens. But the second thing is, we, because we're the world's reserve current, principal reserve currency, we don't need to rush this project and we don't need to be first to market. A dollar CBDC would have potentially large implications here and around the world 
And we'll be sure to think carefully about all of that and engage very broadly with the public uh, uh, around the world, and particularly here in the United States, before we even approach a decision. So, um, so let me come to the United States and how we're how we're actually thinking about this. So, if I can just provide a little context today, the public can own central bank money in the form of currency, and financial institutions can own central bank money in the form of reserves, which are digital. Um, banks offer digital money in the form of bank deposits. And, and although they're obligations of commercial banks and not of the central bank or the government, they're backed by the federal deposit insurance up to 250000 giving them characteristics of trusted money. So that's, that's the world we're, we're in. It's also a world in which there's tremendous innovation in the payments area. We're going to have ubiquitous instant payments very soon. People will be able to make a payment uh, immediately uh, in immediately available funds rather than waiting hours, days to clear. And these improvements are being uh, driven by both private and public sector actors. So we want to foster that innovation, but we want to assure through regulation that the public is protected. So does the public want, the real threshold question for us is, does the public want or need a new digital form of central bank money to complement what is already a highly efficient, reliable, and innovative payments arena and system? What exactly is the need here? How can we address it? What are the costs and benefits of, of adding a CBDC to the mix uh, at this time? So the potential benefits at, at, uh, could be more efficient, more inclusive payment system, and consistent with our essential ongoing role as the issuer of the trusted currency, the, the sovereign anchor, which has provides so much benefit. And I, I think we all agree on that. Uh, but there's significant risks as well. There's the cyber risk, uh, there's money laundering and terrorist financing. In addition, the financial stability risks that Jens mentioned, we don't, we don't want to destabilize the two-tiered system. We, we're sort of uh, purveyors of stability, macroeconomic stability, price stability, financial stability. We have a, a two-tier system. Central banks interface with banks, banks interface with the public, and we do not want to destabilize that. We, and therefore, we don't want to compete with uh, with banks for funding. We, we also, in a time of severe stress, don't want to create the, the basis for a run. And, and so there's just a tremendous amount of thinking going on uh, on how we can capture the potential benefits while also managing those potential risks. And um, uh, in the BIS work that we've done with other central banks, we identified three principles, the first of which is do no harm, the second of which is uh, coexistence of a central bank digital currency with with commercial bank money and, and cash, and the third of which is fostering innovation and efficiency. So th now you ask about uh, what we're we actually doing, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up in a second, but um, what we're doing is a broad program of experimentation and investigation about whether to issue a CBDC, and if so, how would we resolve the many design choices to be made in light of those potential benefits and risks? Um, so we're collaborating with other central banks at the BIS and elsewhere. Uh, we've also, um, uh, we've got uh, uh, at the board here, what we call the tech lab. That's a multidisciplinary, multi, it's a virtual group across more than half of the uh, reserve banks have active work, way more than half uh, on central bank digital currency. I won't try to name them because I'll leave somebody out. If I do that, that would be a mistake. Um, doing various things. You ask about Boston. So we're collaborating with MIT on a multi-year effort to build a hypothetical digital, digital currency for central bank use. It's intended to support our broader efforts, obviously. So the, the focus really, though, is on developing an understanding of the capabilities and limitations of the relevant technologies. It's not an attempt to create a prototype. In effect, they're saying, let's try to build the basis for a central and see what we learn for a CBDC, and, and we'll see what we learn. Uh, Atlanta is very active. Um, other, I, I won't mention, uh, as I said, but ultimately the bottom line is to, to, to move forward on this, we would need buy-in from Congress, from the administration, from broad elements of the public. So when we haven't really begun the, the job of, of that public engagement. So you can expect us to move with great care and transparency in considering a CBDC, as is our obligation, and, and we're doing that now. So just as a matter of curiosity, um, and I'd like to ask this question to Jens Wiedemann as well, one of the things that came out of the BIS's survey, which is fascinating, is it's not clear whether it's even legal in many ju jurisdictions. I think half of the central bank survey said they weren't sure. Um, is it legal to create this kind of thing at the moment in either the US or Europe? Um, 
Chairman Powell and then um, Jens Wiedemann? You know, we would, um, that's a good question. And we would not, we would not proceed with this without support from Congress. And I, I think that would ideally come in the form of an authorizing law rather than us trying to interpret our law to, to enable this. So I think that's how we would look at it. What about the situation in Europe? Is it legal in Europe? I think by the time we will proceed with, or if we proceed uh, with the central bank digital currency, you can be sure that the legal basis uh, will be sound. And I think it's important to engage with the broad public also about the potential benefits and also side effects. And that's exactly what we've done during the consultation that we've conducted uh, in Europe. And uh, now after this uh, phase, I think we need to engage also more with the legislative, but also explaining what a central bank digital currency can and cannot achieve. And again, my point from before is we shouldn't focus solely on central bank digital currency when we talk about modernizing the payment landscapes, landscape. I mean, what we did, for instance, on our side here is to team up uh, not only with our finance ministry, but also with representatives from the financial industry and the so-called real economy to explore what other avenues would be fruitful uh, to, uh, to investigate. And uh, I mean, some of the um, beneficial effects of a CBDC could also be achieved, for instance, through uh, tokenized uh, commercial bank money. I mean, if we're talking about uh, automated payment programmable uh, money, that must not, need not necessarily be uh, a CBDC. And we are also uh, here at the Bundesbank uh, currently having a, a project that uh, um, works on a so-called trigger solution. So we would have blockchain, private blockchain uh, that triggers payments in our target two system in central bank money. And I think the, the main point as uh, Jay already mentioned is that would preserve that two-tier system. At the moment, uh, we distribute our central bank money to, our, uh, to, to the commercial banks, basically, uh, and don't engage directly uh, with retail customers. And in that sense, with that trigger solution, we could preserve that two-tier system. And uh, I think we should explore those solutions as well, which are less invasive, in a sense, and uh, less disruptive than, than CBDC before we take that step to introduce CBDC. So that way you avoid just intermediating the banks in a way that will create a new set of financial headaches. I guess one of the big questions, and I'd like to ask this maybe to Augustine and the others, is to what degree is this conversation about CBDCs or alternative token-based solutions, stable coins, um, to what degree is this really an attempt to fend off the unwelcome financial stability threats created by innovations like Bitcoin. Are you concerned about the financial stability implications of those? And is this an attempt to fend that off? Um, maybe Augustin, you can ask that, and then I'd like to ask that to Jay and to um, Jens. Well, yes, certainly there is a financial stability risk there, a financial stability consideration there. There is also this element of uh, having arbitrage between a very regulated supervised system as the one that the, that depends on uh, the centrality of central banks, even if it's a two-tier system, uh, in a system where, you know, for example, uh, no AML CFT considerations is, uh, are, are anticipated, no? Uh, other, other important aspects there is that uh, in, in, in some in, in stable coins, I mean, for example, take, take the idea of stable coin. Stable coin uh, says that they need to have backing to guarantee its value. So it needs to import value from, a third, uh, for, from another type of asset. So how could that be superior to the original asset that is providing value? So that, there, there by itself, it's a weakness. And uh, if you see through history, different uh, manifestations of uh, ideas similar to stable coins have failed because at different points in time, the backing of those currencies have not been there at the appropriate moment. Uh, and of course, as, as both uh, Jay and, and Jens have, have mentioned, uh, Central banks are there to provide stability. Therefore, we cannot uh, support ideas that inherently have elements of instability there. 
And that's why, uh, you know, the name of stable coin, uh, uh, they have to put stable there because otherwise it's not stable. And to get that stable, they, they need to import it from some other place. So that, that for me is a very, very uh, important uh, uh, drawback of, of those things. A good thing that, that the ideas have is, is that they have developed very nice technology there. And they, they, they are, uh, those, there are ideas there that, that should be rescued. And that's why I like to speak and, and many of us like to speak about uh, public-private partnerships where we bring together uh, what central banks can put on the table. Uh, nobody else can do that. And at the same time, we need to be able to exploit the innovation, the drive of the private sector. And I think that's the way we can have a, a modern, a top-notch top payment systems with the most security. So basically what you're saying is that you're trying to out Libra Libra. Um, or take all the <laughs> coming from Silicon Valley and transplant them into central banking, as I said, making central bankers cool. Um, Jay, I'd like to ask you, I mean, Chairman Powell, um, sorry, I'm dealing with different forms of address and cultural expectations. I know in America, everyone uses titles. In Europe, they don't. So apologies if I cause offense to anyone watching by addressing you wrongly. Um, but um, I'm curious, Chairman Powell, are you essentially trying to beat them at their own game? To what degree do you see things like Bitcoin or... Libra representing financial stability threats that you're trying to get ahead of? First, uh, I spent nine years here trying to get people to call me Jay, so please. Um, <laughs> okay, that's kind of been cool. <laughs> let, let, me say, let me say, yeah, absolutely. Um, if, let, me, let me just take, take a step, step back and say that our work on CBDCs is not primarily motivated by the appearance on the scene of cryptocurrencies and stable coins. It really is uh, fundamentally technology has made it possible for us to offer a new form of trusted money and that sovereign anchor that has been so important for economic development for a very long time. And we're looking carefully at whether to do that. So turning to your question, crypto assets, uh, which we call them crypto assets, uh, you know, they're, they're highly volatile, see Bitcoin, and therefore not really useful as a store of value. And they're not backed by anything they're more of an asset for speculation. So they're also not particularly in use as a means of payment. It's more uh, a speculative asset that's, that's essentially a substitute for gold rather than for the dollar. And I think with crypto assets, the, the, the public needs to understand the risks. The principal thing is there's the volatility. There's also the outsized energy requirements re requirement for, for mining uh, and the fact that they're not backed by anything, which I, which I mentioned. Um, turning to stable coins, so to the extent a stable coin is backed by sovereign currencies of leading nations, that's certainly an improvement over crypto assets, I would say. But nonetheless, where does the credibility come from? It comes from that sovereign currency that is the backstop. Uh, the thing is, existing sovereign currencies are, are issued with the benefit of the public in mind. The potentially fast and wide adoption of a global stable coin, potentially a global currency governed only by the incentives of a private company, is something that will deserve and will receive the highest level of regulatory expectations. Um, so, and is regulation where it needs to be on global stable coins yet? It's, it's not, but we're, we're making progress. None, nonetheless, stable coins may have a role to play with appropriate regulation, but that role will not be to form the basis of a new global monetary system. Um, private uh, stable coins are not gonna be an appropriate substitute for a sound monetary system based in central bank money. Uh, and I'll stop there. Right. Jens, how does it look from the perspective of the Eurozone? Because, of course, one of the things that I think is, you know, particularly, um, you know, provoked spark particular angst in Europe is the fact that so much of this innovation is coming out of the US or China rather than homegrown, um, which raises all kinds of issues about privacy concerns, because, of course, privacy expectations are very different in Europe. But, I mean, are you concerned that this poses a kind of financial stability threat that you have to head off? in terms of swings of value of Bitcoin or things like that? No, I think our perspective is pretty similar to that uh, of uh, Jay and, and Augustine. I think the main point here is, if you talk about the means of payment, and that was our focus so far, then uh, stability is a, uh, a precondition. I mean, you cannot have a useful means of payment or a store of value 
if the, under, the, the underlying uh, um, asset is widely fluctuating in, in, in value. And that's why, uh, I mean, that's why basically uh, sometimes this discussion conveys the impression that Bitcoins are widely used uh, to transform transactions. But that, that's not the case. I mean, it's mainly, as Jay said, a speculative uh, asset. Uh, and I'm not sure when you uh, um, uh, effectuated your, your last payment in Bitcoins to purchase a newspaper around the corner or something on the internet, but I think most people uh, will, will just say they, they didn't. Um, so, and, and that's why the discussion now slowly shifts towards the stable, coin, uh, stable coins because they are lending the stability from, from, from the legal, legal tenders. And, and again, my point is we have to look, I mean, we provide the stability to the system, but we can learn from those uh, providers by looking at their technology and exploring whether this technology might make sense also uh, in, in, our, uh, in our environment. Right. Well, I'd like to turn to a slightly different aspect of innovation that I know that the BIS is all over. And again, I do think it's absolutely fascinating what the BIS is doing with their innovation hubs, not least because it's shifting the geographical balance towards Asia and elsewhere. But um, the question of AI. Um, we've had this big drama explode in the last um, year around Ant Financial. Um, and Jack Ma, and obviously a lot of that is to do with the issue of internal politics and the regulatory approach taken by Beijing. But at the heart of that story is also the question that affects everybody, which is what is gonna to happen to credit scoring in a world where financial institutions are using AI to make credit judgments to a degree that essentially outstrips the ability of regulators to watch um, and potentially changes finance very dramatically. Um, suddenly, central bankers are going to have to become technologists, data companies, and so are private sector banks. To what degree do you think, um, maybe I can start with Jay um, on this one, to what degree do you think the US regulators are actually awake to these issues around AI um, and credit scoring and the changes in the financial system? And how can the Fed respond to that? We're very much awake to that uh, set of issues and very focused on that set of issues. And you know the issue it really comes down to uh, algorithms that allocate credit. You know that everyone's using that these very fast turnarounds, and uh, what you find is in many cases there, it's an algorithm. It's it it uh, is acting in a discriminatory way because of the way it's constructed. In other words, in a, in a way that discriminates against certain people without any economic basis, and so. You know, we're very focused on that issue. We've met with, you know, the top data scientists at all of the private companies that are not even ones that are not in the, um, you know, the financial sector. And, and we've, we've been working on this for, for a couple of years now and providing guidance and understanding. And, and, and financial institutions do have to understand that their, their algorithms have to work and have to, have to uh, allocate credit in a way that doesn't discriminate against uh, you know, for for non-economic reasons, even inadvertently, because it's an algorithm that doesn't know what it's doing. But nonetheless, the result can be discriminatory. So, it's not an easy issue. Uh, but the banks are quite well aware of it, and we are. And uh, as I as I mentioned, we've got top data science working on it here and and in the private sector. What about in Europe, um, Jens? Are the, is there concern that moving to credit allocation on the basis of AI and other forms of credit scoring is going to create new financial stability threats? I think we're very aware of uh, the, the issue. Uh, and uh, like Jay said, there are those uh, ethical questions, the discrimination that can come with it, but also uh, other financial stability issues that haven't been mentioned so far, which is a dependency on third parties in some uh, aspects of, of this market. There's uh, cream skimming that might become uh, an issue with those uh, algorithms. So, um, uh, and this comes on top of, of a potential hurt behavior of correlated risks. Uh, so there are risks that we are uh, very concerned about. At the same time, um, at the same time, those algorithms also uh, present advantages uh, that we should uh, consider. And one of them is of course, that they also allow access to credit for those with a limited credit history, for instance. They also allow a better risk diversification uh, and uh, risk sharing. Uh, if you think of those credit uh, platforms, 
and basically they help reducing costs in the banking sector. So at the end of the day, it's about weighing those uh, benefits and costs and making sure that the banks have the proper uh, internal governance mechanisms in place, that they understand the risks uh, and, uh, and take them into account. Right. One thing I'm curious about, I mean, I'd like to bring you in, Augustin, here and ask, um, Jake observed last week that COVID-19 crisis had accelerated pressure on central banks to collaborate around this, whether it's either the payments um, issues and trying to get some kind of more global consistency, whether it's talking to each other about how they're going to back some kind of stable coin or deal with these credit scoring questions. I'm curious, Augustin, I mean, do you think COVID-19 is going to be an accelerant to these discussions? In terms of what the BI is involving the Yes, I mean, I think COVID-19 changed the, the world, changed the landscape. Uh, many policies that were implemented, rightfully so, uh, have produced very good results. Uh, but the evolution of the crisis it, it's, itself has led to uneven results. Uh, you know, I mean, for example, the incidence of the crisis on some sectors have been much larger than in others. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think it is it is important uh, to consider what are those uh, those uh, side effects, and uh, in, in no matter in, in in which field you are talking about, uh, payments, uh, uh, credit, uh, income, you know, inequality is not uh, conducive to good results and good policies. Therefore, we need to take them into account and level the playing field as much as as much as we can. Therefore, I I, I am convinced that uh, we need to be looking into ways where we can level the playing field, given the instruments we have, uh, and we need to have a balanced approach. I mean, I think going back to the discussion we just had about the uh, algorithms, I think that the point that Jens made that the uh, algorithms have also good 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 aspects uh, is very valuable. Uh, we have written a paper here, uh, the very good paper in the VHS, that basically makes the point that the uh, data uh, can substitute for collateral. And oftentimes uh, people cannot get uh, cannot get a credit because they don't have the right collateral that institutions have. But the adequate set of data uh, uh, can substitute for that collateral. So we have to think also creatively how those algorithms can be incorporated without forgetting that an algorithm is code with opinions. <laughs> well, I would say it's code with culture training and someone who's trained as an anthropologist. <laughs> fascinated by how an the anthropology of the central banking tribe and the financial system um, is so important. But um, I'd like to quickly ask you, Jay, when you said that you thought that COVID-19 would accelerate these discussions in your speech last week, what did you mean? Did you think that the crisis has exposed some of the weaknesses in the payment system globally? Yes, I, so I would say maybe in three ways. First, at the absolute acute phase of the crisis, there was a need to get um, support payments to people quickly. And, you know, our our regular way payment system, which gets things there in a few days, was was challenged to deliver massive millions and hundreds of millions of payments really quickly. And there was a sense that people were, and, and you could see spending pick up immediately after uh, the payments arrived. So people were really with their, you know, with their companies closed down and, and, and on furlough, they were, they were in need of quick payments. So speed is one thing. Another thing just is people need to be able to access the financial system remotely because people weren't going to banks. And so that's important. The third thing is, is what Augustine said, which is it, it, it highlighted across a whole range of things, the disparate impact of, of so many things on poor, lower, moderate income communities. And in particular here, it highlights the importance for greater inclusiveness in our financial system. People who are less likely to have remote access to their financial services and in dire need of quick, of quick support at times. So I, th I think... Um, it, uh, it, it underscores what is already a high, folk, high priority for us, which is the need to have greater, more inclusive uh, payment system and a more inclusive economy. Right, thank you. Well, 
Thank you to all of you for a very interesting discussion. Frankly, I think we could talk for another hour at least because there are so many huge issues raised here. Um, and that's not surprising in a way because we are seeing an extraordinary confluence of innovation and finance right now. It really is quite a historic moment made um, more intense, potentially more angst ridden by the degree of political upheavals, by the degree of changing patterns of globalization and by the rising expectations that the public have when they look to central bankers. So you have your work cut out in the coming years, to put it mildly. Um, I commend the BIS Innovation Hub for trying to grapple with these issues. Um, the very fact that I've struggled to cover even half of the issues in 45 minutes indicates the breadth and magnitude of your work. Um, and as Jay just said, the COVID-19 crisis has in many ways um, accelerated the spotlight on these um, questions. So thanks to all of you. Best of luck to both the Bundesbank and the Federal Reserve in trying to navigate a path through this and other central banks. And very best of luck to the BIS in trying to forge a common collaborative solution. Let, it, let us hope it's not like trying to herd cats, but it's certainly going to be a challenge um, in trying to make, if not central banks dance, then to make them truly 21st century and innovative. So thank you very much indeed to all of you. And thank you to all of you.